I always say, I would say this is like a piece of advice to people looking back is be hungry, humble, and kind and willing to learn. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. Come on, engineer. You can, it can okay. be suboptimal. <laughs> you know? It's like, you know me, I'm such a perfectionist. <laughs> I'm actually going to say Daniel Ricardo, and this is rooted in the fact that he almost ran me over on a scooter in Austin, <laughs> Texas. I was on crutches for the rest of the weekend, which kind of sucked, but it was really, really still fun. I had a great time, and I was taken very well care of by the the Red Bull team who I was there with, and then Aston Martin after I did get hurt. And then even like I was at like one of the parties on crutches, like nothing was stopping me that weekend, so... <laughs> Wow. Not broken, badly sprained, but it was like really funny that they were like, yeah, we've saw the drivers. And I'm like, you're not helping me. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the latest episode of George's Strip and the Dipping podcast. I'm your host, F1 Blag. And today's guest, Molly Oxner, is one of those people who can do just about anything. Molly started watching NASCAR in 2014, and little did the then engineering student know that a decade later she'd be working in the sport. But trust Molly not to take the traditional path. Before joining McLaren's NASCAR Cup team this season, she was already an established tech talker and had launched two podcasts. I know you'll love this episode, so let's get to it. Molly, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here and chat all things F1 and motorsport and uh, super excited oh to meet y'all and, and get into it. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much to chat about when it comes to motorsport. But before we dive into that and, and your various uh, pursuits, I'm interested to know <laughs> a bit about you in terms of how if you were meeting someone for the first time, how would you introduce yourself? Um, I am a motorsports field application engineer supporting um, mainly NASCAR, but then I also founded and hosted the, I, I founded and run the largest and only female run motorsports technical education TikTok page and host a podcast in my free time on motorsports as well. <laughs> That's like the elevator pitch. No, well, I know. And you, you struggled to fit it all into the elevator, right? We're now oh, out of the elevator. Yes. We're in the boardroom. Except, no, but it's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's extremely impressive. Uh, so where would you say your passion for motorsport comes from? Um, sort of what's your first memory of really uh, falling in love with the sport? It's kind of funny, actually, because it's a lot of it's a lot of the reason certain women, especially in the sports, especially fans get crap for from other fans. But had I not found motorsports the way that I did, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So kind of my earliest memories Motorsport was kind of always around. I'm from Detroit, which is the Motor City. One of my relatives is a really big NASCAR racing fan, but never really piqued my interest. I liked cars, thought cars were cool. Earliest memory of a car for me was a Ferrari. It's kind of like the kid draws a red car kind of thing, and it's a Ferrari. However, I didn't really find racing until I was in engineering school. I was kind of peaked to go into engineering by some EVs and hybrids and kind of the the next generation of the automotive industry. Never really thought motorsports would be my thing. I don't know if BuzzFeed was as big as it is for you guys, but in the heyday of BuzzFeed, there was um, like these 25 reasons why this is really hot or this is the coolest, whatever, right? I see this article that said um, 25 reasons why NASCAR drivers are the hottest athletes and I clicked on it. <laughs> And <laughs> wind up being like, oh, yeah, that guy's kind of good looking. And then go and ask some friends that I'm living with about who this person is. And turns out it's Dale Earnhardt Jr., NASCAR royalty. They tell me I have to watch the race with them that weekend, which is the 2020 or 2024. Jeez, words are hard today. 2014 Daytona mm. 500 that he wins. And then I proceed to fall in love with motorsports, need to understand why the cars turn left, how they do it so fast, how they can do it for so many laps, and then proceeded to kind of just accumulate motorsports along the way. So like my first Formula One champion was um, Sebastian Vettel. I picked up um, WEC and IMSA and IndyCar kind of along the way there. And then it kind of became this huge part of my life. And I still was like, I have no idea how to make a career out of this, but I'm super into it and I love it. And that's kind of how I got involved. And then 2020 2021 ish i was constantly explaining race cars to my friends that's i'm the engineer who knows a lot about race cars and answers those questions for her friends and <laughs> i just started recording conversations i had 
and putting them online, which has brought me here into like the content and podcasting space. And then it also has also helped me transition my professional career to the motorsports world. But that's ironically, I thought a race car driver was hot and that would have never brought me here had I not seen that article. So we have something to praise BuzzFeed for. And yes, it was yes. Uh, relatively large <laughs> here. Although, you know, the sad thing about, I guess, that second generation of, I don't know, was it online journalism is that it's over yeah. um, for them. Yeah. Uh, so, but what's it's interesting good. is, yeah, you, you said that you were um, in engineering school already before you fell in love with Yes. Uh, yeah. So was. what were you I going was... there for? <laughs> so I was going for my degree in mechanical engineering, which is still what I graduated with. But I was really kind of my goal at the time was I want to work on electric vehicles. That's what got me into engineering. That's what really excites me about engineering. Ironically enough, um, that's what I, I want to go do. And that is what I did. I graduated and got to do that. I did that for the first seven years of my career. And um, in the meantime, motorsports just seemed like this big unattainable boys club, but I was like making my interests known. And I was between year two and year three, uh, to put it in like British terms of when I did find racing. And so it actually became a tool to help me get through school too. I was really struggling with um, fluid mechanics. For anybody that's not gone to engineering school, that's like the class that aerodynamicists literally their entire existence begins in and I was really struggling with that class and I'm, I'm at tutoring hours with the professor and he goes I know you really like race cars I'm going to put this into a race car term for you and we're going to talk about this like it's a race car right and see if that helps and it did because I was like wait I actually get those like terms and I understand that because I've I've read about it and I, I know about it from that and so it actually also became a tool to help me get through engineering classes as well because I could put it into kind of a form that I understood a little bit better and it, it would help me kind of progress through my classes. No, it makes sense. And and what's really interesting is you can hear the energy coming through your, your passion. And you, <laughs> you said, uh, so like 2020, 2021, not necessarily globally a fun time because it was sort of peak COVID, but you were yeah. talking about explaining motorsport to your, or, or motor racing to your friends. So what yes. came first? Was it like your professional foray into motorsport? from mechanical engineering or was it the podcast side or was it the TikTok side or what, you know, what, give us so an order here. the TikToks, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So it was the TikTok side that came first. A lot of that, like I said, started from, well, if my friends have questions, especially with like the new arrow set coming into Formula One, other people must have questions. And so I started just making videos on what I was already talking about and like explaining the car launches and what I saw in the new cars with the new ground effect arrow. And was like, you know, there's nobody really doing this like this and, and making it understandable because the tech side of Formula One, especially in motorsports, is very not only gate kept, but it's basically treated at a, if you don't have like a PhD level, why are you asking questions and why are you here learning? And so that was kind of like, there, there was a need there. And so I was like, you know what, we're going to make this a easy to understand place. And then the TikTok led to the podcasts. Um, which into long form content. And then that all led to my professional career in motorsports. Actually, it was a little self-servicing, I would say, because if you actually looked at my resume on paper, when I was applying for motorsports jobs, I didn't have anything that would really say I have motorsports experience, but I have all of this tech knowledge, right? I have all this book smarts and I'm book smarts and industry smarts and street smarts are completely different things in the world. Right. However, I was kind of like, how can I not only demonstrate that in something that is like a portfolio almost, but also kind of helps the community because I saw that the need was there. So it was this tiny bit of self-servicing in my content that was like, you know, I can show somebody that I know my stuff. I can pull up my page and show the engagements and the topics that I'm talking about and breaking down to show that I actually do have a really good foundation in this sport. And not only do I have that, I have a well-established professional network as well through this. And I can show I have kind of a good groundwork laid and my willingness to learn. And my, I'm, I'm a sponge. I love to learn. So like my willingness to learn, my energy, my passion, my enthusiasm, I have that. And I, I'm ready to go kind of thing. And I know that I'm not turnkey with certain things, but I have it, it's there, you know. And so it actually did help me make the jump professionally, believe it or not. And it's kind of one of those weird statistics of I'm a fan. I kind of did the content side and I really was kind of working in it on the content side and then was able to transition fully with my, my day job now. 
No, incredible. And, you know, I'm sure it's hard work, but it does sound like you're living the dream at the same time. So, so huge congrats. <laughs> Um, Thank and, you. I'm tired. <laughs> no, I can imagine. Well, thanks for making time for us and, and our listeners. I of really course. appreciate no, it. No, I, I always will. I was so excited for this. I thought I saw it like drop off my calendar by accident and I was just looking mm. at the wrong week, but I was like, oh my God, where'd it go? I was looking so forward to doing this. Oh, that's lovely. Um, and so like uh, you did the tech talks, which, you know, I like a good pun. Mm -hmm. And you were talking Thank a little you. bit about like, uh, you know, hinting at inclusivity, but gatekeeping. Yes. And like yes. a reflection for me is like, when I started my career, I didn't, I studied maths. So I was coming into a new profession and there were lots of economists there. And I found a lot mm -hmm. of them couldn't explain things or, or I was struggling to understand what they were saying. Mm -hmm. My Like something that has generally helped my mental health across my life is to assume incompetence and not malice uh, <laughs> where, wherever possible. So do you think gatekeeping like to what degree do you think it is sort of deliberate gatekeeping and to what degree is it people don't have the empathy to communicate with different audiences effectively? I think it's a combination of both, especially mm. in the tech community, because especially in kind of the engineering and STEM world, which I think you've probably seen. Um, if you ask someone to explain this to someone like they have no idea, a lot of tech, highly technical folks can't always bridge that gap. So I think that that's not necessarily an incompetence thing. I think it's just they're so used to talking about it every single day at these high levels. They assume everybody else is on the same level. where So that isn't really like a malice side, you know. But it's just they're so used to like the broadcast does not I find the broadcast are really, really guilty of this. They'll get into all of this technical nitty gritty like Sam or Crofty or Ted will get into something. And I'm like, I know what you're talking about. But my friend sitting next to me doesn't. And I have to now explain it to them. And it's because they talk about it so much. They assume everybody knows about it like they know about it. And so I think that's where part of the like tech side of it, some of it comes from. And I do think that then there's the other side where it is kind of that malicious, like, oh, too many American fans are ruining the sport, you know, like that pedestal that they have, especially with the Formula One world. Other series, I don't feel like it's that way as much, like not to name names, but I feel like that's where like I really was like I saw it the most. And so I think that there is a little bit of that is that kind of like elitism in motorsports we talk about in, in some other spaces and kind of some of the like, oh, we're better than everybody kind of mentality. And so when new fans want to come in and learn, people are like, we don't want to, you know, kind of thing. And so that's where I kind of try to break that down and make it more open. But that's kind of where I see it is there's kind of the two facets and one's kind of fully unintentional. And then there's the other side that is a little bit more like, oh, you want to come learn about this sport, but you don't understand this or that. Well, you're a terrible fan and this and that, you know, kind of perpetuating that. And then it makes people not want to ask questions and not want to dig deeper into it and kind of not want to learn as much because they're kind of met with some hostility when they go to ask, you know. And maybe incompetence wasn't the right word for me, but because because I guess they're hyper competent, but then maybe in the the kind of art of or the skill of communication mm -hmm. they haven't uh, yeah. you know they've lost track I guess of their audience mm -hmm. so what what was interesting that you said there was I suppose you you talked about communicating and reaching people of different different technical mm -hmm. abilities but then you also yeah. talked about the American audience so yes. um, Formula One clearly you know the purchase by Liberty Media of uh, mm -hmm. The commercial rights Formula One is a big play on trying to expand the sport globally, but particularly in the US market. What yeah. do you think could be done better? Not, you know, not to steal your intellectual property, because I'm sure you're writing a brief and about to pitch <laughs> it. But, you know, what, yeah, what, what do you think the simple things are or the compli complicated things are that could do better to really reach that audience? I think for me, I see it as one kind of there's like this big topic I call it like barrier of entry to the sport. And I've talked about this numerous places. So you're not stealing any, any, I hear anything. It's, it's been, I've talked about it so many places, but the barrier of entry to the sport that's financially like the broadcast level um, with like the way things are communicated, all of that, you know, if you go look at some of the other series like IMSA and WEC from the knowledge side, they have like a one oh one level that's accessible on their own series websites. If you're curious, you can go and get that foundation immediately for free. And then their broadcasts go and do this fantastic job of if you can just even catch a clip on social media or even like, like I said on the broadcast, they do such a good job of saying, well, we're talking about this and this is what that is. 
And NASCAR has actually gone the extra step if we're going to talk about other American Motorsports series. And they have what's called the cutaway car. And it is a full 3D animated car that they will say, well, we're talking about this on the car. They will pull it up on the broadcast in real time, pull body panels away from this model of the car, point to it, and show you everything that like you need to know then and there in that moment. And then you get into obviously the cost side when it gets into like barrier of entry, where we're seeing the price of grandstand and GA tickets and all of this stuff becoming higher and higher and higher and higher, where you have all of this interest and demand and you kind of know they're going to pay that because they want it. But what does that get you? I think I spent more in 2022 on my three-day grandstand ticket for Circuit of the Americas than I did for every other race I went to that year combined. And I did like five or six races that year across multiple series. So I think that there's kind of a twofold. You need to not only have a lower barrier of entry of cost, but I think you also need to lower the barrier of entry from just even a socials and um, knowledge kind of standpoint, because you have the teams doing all of this great stuff. But like, if I were a fan and I had no clue what I was getting into and I was like, this is really cool. Where, where is some of that stuff and drive to survive did some of that, but there's not really like a true kind of, I can type in their website and I can find stuff like that easily accessible. If that makes sense. No, it makes a lot of sense and not to necessarily uh, offend Formula One, but it wasn't that long ago that it was really difficult to Google the start time of a Grand Prix, like to the extent that someone created an app and then eventually like Formula One were like, yeah, okay, this is stupid. We need to do a better job. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe it's a mindset thing of like whether they think they have an elite product that they don't need to cater to the audience and and maybe it's shifting now. I've talked about this on one of my other podcasts, um, Engine CB and Espresso. We talked about how hard it is to sometimes look outside of your bubble, we'll say, like the different series um, and like stuff like that. For like that blows my mind that you couldn't find a start time because that's so easy with all these other series that I kind of pay attention to, right? But it's like, wow, that's like such a simple thing. And had they noticed, maybe that wouldn't have ever been like a pain point, you know, like I use this example, I was talking about something called a tire dragon, which is basically just a tool that um, NASCAR and IndyCar use where they drag tires behind a vehicle on a racetrack to lay rubber down in the racing line to help with grip, essentially, because the tires um, on the track are like a cheese grater. I had a engineer reach out to me from a championship winning Formula E team um, at the time and ask if I could give them more information on that specific piece of technology, because that would be something that would be really, really helpful in Formula E. And it it blew my mind. And I think that Formula One, maybe some of these pain points, they think that they're listening to fans and they think they're looking outside of their bubble and maybe they're not. And they're just kind of going along because they see their numbers are up and they're doing these profits and they're getting all of this viewership. But there's some kind of things that need to be fixed, exactly kind of like what you're saying get me started about their bubble because you know i'll be here all night ranting about the fia <laughs> oh, no. and elitism no, careful no before we talk about <laughs> engines evs and espresso because i also love espresso uh, so before we do that oh. yeah i know right incredible i, I feel like we're we gonna have to talk about it but look um before yes. we do that <laughs> this point about um understanding their fans i suppose yeah. um to be polite once you get into the f1 paddock and the f1 circuit and you're traveling around the world and you've got 24 dates or 24 collections of dates you've mm-hmm. got to make, it might be difficult to then sort of put yourself in the shoes of a, you know, ordinary civilian like myself. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. And even I'm in the, the NASCAR cup world and, and for reference, they do 36 races in 39 weeks in a typical season. And I'm on a rotation schedule right now. So I'm not on every weekend, but I already am like, wow, I'm like, that. what's going on? Wait, huh? Like I, I am. I kind of see how it would be hard on a straight twenty-four race. That's all you have to like. You have to get to those dates, kind of things. You have to get to the grid. I'm. I can see it, but at the same time, it's like as much as you're you're traveling or you're scrolling on your phone, you don't see some of these things. It's kind of like the the counter argument, right? But I can definitely see how hard it is to get out of the bubble. But then from a um, like empathy interviewing and design thinking standpoint, um, 
they they send out all of these surveys and there's all of this these opportunities for feedback for fans and they they look at their interactions on socials obviously and it's just kind of one of those it's hard to understand how we're still having some of the problems that we're having with all of the avenues that the series does try to have and is it just the is it a volume thing you don't have enough personnel is it a like there's so much feedback you don't know where to start and then the bubble are you just so overloaded you can't you don't get a chance kind of thing and I feel like there's so many low-hanging fruits that the FIA and, and some of these series could go for but likely a byproduct of the the chaos of their bubble they might not ever get to I, I mean look um, maybe now I've swung the conversation too far in the wrong direction and we're all making excuses for them but like going, like going, no, and 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 you're, we're right to be balanced. <laughs> but um, like going to the very basics here, right? And if the let's yeah. say the viewership has gone up, but growth is slowing. Let's say that the yes. commercial revenues are going up, um, but will they always go up? Doesn't it always just boil down to how entertaining the on-track product is? And and maybe it doesn't always. But what I mean is, if the on-track product was fantastic, and the commentators were sort of effusive in their sort of energy about describing all of that. Would the tech kind of knowledge and the barrier to entry be as important given that F1 is frankly not very competitive at the moment? What do you think about that? I think we see it in IMSA. I think that IMSA is a prime counter argument to that, that the on-track product is fantastic. The barrier to entry and cost is very low. The announcers are really exciting and they're doing it well. And I, it's kind of one of those where it's like, I can get, full access in a weekend, much cheaper for a fraction of a Formula One tickets price. I'm in the garage, I'm in the pit lane, whatever, right? I feel like there is going to come a point where can you justify the on-track product for the price? I always use IMS as a great example because it, the cost is so low and it blows my mind for the great racing you're getting. And it's one of those things we saw it I personally believe we saw it happen with NASCAR in the early 2000s where the on-track product became so terrible you couldn't justify the price. That's It was one of those things where they were kind of not delivering on track and the bubble burst. And so I I think that there could come a point where the bubble could burst in Formula 1 and maybe I'm missing the point of your, your conversation, but I think that that's where the barrier of entry, I struggle because knowing the like business side and they're just going to want to keep milking that popularity if the on-track product gets better i think they would raise the prices actually i think it would it would reverse the problem it would it would make the problem worse basically because they know they have all of this demand clamoring when the on-track product's bad or the on-track product's not that great which i would actually say i don't believe it is i think that this reg set has really still got some of the issues we've had in the past but i think that they they would probably just continue to charge if the on-track product is good. And they would be like, well, we've got all this awesome racing and, and use, I can see it, the big highlight reel of some side-by-side -side battles and come check it out, you know? And I think that it would just continue to drive, I think, the craze and, and the price. Because if you look at the engagements now with everybody saying the interest is waning with this kind of Red Bull and Max Dominance era, um, but the numbers are still crazy for viewership and engagements i think if there was competitive on track product it would probably exasperate the issue I agree and amen to everything you said so we'll talk about <clears throat> uh the miami grand prix coming up in a bit and we'll reflect on the china grand prix but before we do that engines evs and espressos the high caffeine <laughs> yeah. high energy high vibe podcasts uh, tell me <laughs> why like because i love all three of those things but what brought those yes. together for you so what kind of brought all those together is um, the brainchild of me and one of my very close friends, Abby Rockshit. Um, she is a consultant by day, so she's got this business mind, and she has a really deep automotive background with that. And then I'm technical with my EVs and motorsports and, and engineering background, and we kind of felt like we brought a very interesting perspective to the space, especially around like why we race and road cars and the business side of, okay, there's not road relevancy here. And we talk a lot about that. And so we kind of originally kind of build it as, well, it's not your boyfriend's cars and coffee, you know, because it's cars and coffee have gone together for so long. We both love coffee and we wanted to talk about cars of all kind. 
and we love a good alliteration, we came up with Injun ZBs of Espresso. So we, I, the tagline is the podcast about caffeine machine and all things in between. And that's really what it is. We kind of talk about any and everything and motorsports, automotive, EVs, coffee. We were talking about like, we always talk about what our favorite drink we've had of the week is, or did we try something adventurous and fun or a little bit of coffee education, you know, because much like the car world, the coffee world is very kind of male dominated often and, and a little bit of an attitude when you try to ask questions. So it's just kind of a fun little offshoot that we came up with that has been an absolute blast. And then I obviously have my other podcast with Dr. Obbs, but that's kind of the, I have these two, I have the fully tech and then I have the the tech with some coffee and we can talk about the real industry of automotive and all of that. And so it's super fun. No, it sounds fun. Uh, and you've got to tell me, what is your favorite coffee? Is it a short coffee like an espresso or is it a longer one like a latte or a, white, a flat white? Like what, what's your go-to? It, so my go-to usually is either a short. So I'll do just a couple like espresso shot pulls or I'm typically like a latte girl. <clears throat> How about you? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm espresso straight to the veins. Uh, and I have okay. to control myself <laughs> to have it like to stop having it at about one o'clock or I won't sleep. Yes. Um. Yeah. A typical day for me is I'll wake up and I'll pull a short coffee. So I'll have just the espresso while I get ready to leave for work. And then before I leave, I will make a longer coffee, typically an espresso or not espresso juice, typically a latte to take with me to go into the office and, and have there in the morning. I also am big on the like iced coffee train. So I'll, I'll do that with the French press usually and have that ready if I want that instead for my air quotes, longer coffee. Um, to take in the mornings, but I usually start every day out with just an espresso. No, nice. And um, I try to rationalize my addictions. So <laughs> I heard somewhere that if you hold off having your first coffee for 90 minutes, then it's not terrible because you, it's something about coffee turning off the receptors in your brain that are telling you you're tired. Oh, so you give them the okay. chance to realize that you're that awake and it's the morning and then you have it. But that could be complete rubbish. But I try to live by that. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to look that up. That sounds super interesting because I actually wonder if that's the same thing with like um, hunger suppression too and your your energy levels as well with the brain. I'm, I'm going to look that up. I'm super curious because that's I, I love a good way to rationalize the amount of caffeine I drink in a day. It's yeah, like, it just narrows it, the window, lot. right? So then you go, oh, well, I could have a squillion coffees between sort of nine o'clock and, and one, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. My cutoff's about 2 p.m., before I'm kind of like, oh, I'm going to be up all night if I have anything other than like just a regular um, cup of coffee. If I'm having a, a short espresso, I'm going to be up all night at that point. So I, I know when to make my transition at least because I can have a regular like cup of coffee and go to bed. Yeah, I mean, I, I say one, but one is to then trick my brain into not going beyond two. So, you know, maybe today yeah. I broke that. Who knows? Uh, I won't admit it to myself. <laughs> it's all right. Your secret is safe here if you did. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's lovely that you do a podcast with friend of the show, Dr. Obbs, uh, and yeah. that you have E-Cubed as, as the kind of, is that the proper name or is that just your tag? That's, I don't know. I love we, it. We kind of, that's our little tag. We call it E-Cubed because it's easier to say. <laughs> I love it. I mean, yes. And it helps you remember, well, for me, remembering the order between engines, EVs and espressos. So like, let's segue to, you talked about the NASCAR Cup. Uh, and while you don't yes. do all 36 in 39, um, are you are you kind of drinking coffee on shift? Like how, how arduous is it in a weekend? Talk us through the weekend of it's not, NASCAR. It's not terrible. So we follow garage hours. So we're there when the teams are there. And we're a mix of remote and at the track, depending on what's going on. So if we're at the track, it's typically a race we can drive to from Charlotte. So that's, I sleep in my own bed. I get up my normal coffee routine, typically get something on our way to the track or at the track and I caffeinate that way. Um, the travel races, depending, kind of similar routine, we'll stop somewhere, get coffee. I love to find local coffee when I travel. Um, so I was just in Richmond for a race and had done my research on on where to where to go for coffee and and checked out a few places while we were there. But it does get a little kind of arduous when we get into the other time zones and we're on remote. So I had a race where I was actually on until about 9 30, 10 p.m. my time because it was a West Coast race. So it was a race where they were three hours behind and I was here in Charlotte. So it did get pretty arduous. So I was making a coffee 
about 5.30 and, and knowing I shouldn't have done it, but I needed it because I was sitting there doing my work because you adjust your work hours accordingly, working on my regular work. And that was like my lunchtime. So I always have a coffee usually around or right after lunch. And it, it, it does get a little arduous and it, it's just kind of you adjust accordingly, I would say. But then the fun part too is um, there's so many energy drink sponsors in the series that you can just walk around the paddock and walk around the garage area and the pit lane. And there are just, you can grab them. They're free. If you're there, they're sponsors and they're, they're there for you to kind of engage with the product and enjoy it. And so there's like Celsius and Nas and Mass and Monster and C4 and all of these companies have their displays out and you can go grab one and, and help keep the energy up. So there's no shortage, I would say, of coffee and energy when you're at the track. Um, and I, I know that there are a few people who really care about their coffee. So on their haulers, they will have a nice setup and they will have good coffee. I know specifically in like the IMSA series, the Chip Ganassi team, that's like the place to go for good coffee if you're in the IMSA paddock. But um, I know that it's a big culture within some of the racing paddocks as well. I haven't figured out who's got the good coffee yet um, in the NASCAR kind of garage yet. But I think that there's definitely plenty to be had if, if you are kind of struggling. Sounds, it sounds like you've sussed out like who, well, you can get free caffeine, but also who's got the right caffeine. So that's, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting on, on energy drinks. Um, I haven't quite sort of forayed into that. Obviously Red Bull was much bigger about 10, 15 years ago when I was at university and we yeah. mixed it with a variety of other, uh, liquid, uh, uh drinks. Oh, yes. Who didn't? <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Uh, on, but on things like monster, I'm trying to steer clear because I think it's a slippery slope. So at the moment, I only associate Monster with people drinking it at like seven o'clock on the London Underground. And I think, oh, no, I can't. Oh God, you know. yeah. So I try not to. <laughs> but there we are. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. I've, I've reignited my enjoyment from them of them being in kind of the, the garages and stuff. I, in college, it was either you were Monster or Red Bull. And I was Red <laughs> Bull to mix with numerous other things. And then mm -hmm. Monster, if I needed to stay up and get something done. And haven't really touched them much, but they're they're there. I'm I'm tired. It's gonna be a long day. I just <laughs> I'll go grab one and, and enjoy it. So it's kind of brought a little bit of the like I could drink these back. It's definitely a slippery slope. I would I would definitely agree. And I try to be mindful of that because I will get to the track and I've already had two coffees and then I grab a monster and that's like enough caffeine to kill a horse right <laughs> so <laughs> i have to be very mindful because then i'm overloading it on caffeine and then nobody likes that and that's not a good feeling no well tell us about um the feeling you get when you do your job because you're a field application engineer according uh yeah. to linkedin which is where i do it a lot was. of my research yeah. so like what does <laughs> that mean in practice what are you doing for us lay uh, audience members here so my day job basically is that our customers have our products in their cars and I am there at, with the team I work on. We make sure that our products are working. If they are not working, why are they not working? And we fix them um, while also working on developing the next generation and what's coming next and what do the series need to make the products work even better or meet the needs of what kind of the cars have become. And so our products are in every pretty much racing series in the world. So I basically am a little bit of like a, a helper. Um, and then also I get to go play and, and create things where I'm like, hey, this would actually be really cool if we could do this and include it for the teams and include it in what we need. And so I get to kind of make some stuff that goes on cars or if there's problems, um, fix them or we want to try this and we, we do that and then put it onto the car and get to do it. So it's a little bit of everything, which is really fun, but at its base – the field level of it is like there's stuff on the racetrack. The application is my parts on the car. So how they work on the car, are they functional? What's coming next? Do we need like, it's everything with that, like the actual application, will it work on a cup car kind of thing. And then the engineer side is the engineer, but it's, it's a lot of that. And it's super fun because it's a lot of, I can choose my own adventure outside of the like support side of it, where we're, we're on the track or we're remote supporting our teams who are racing every weekend, but there's a lot of, I can, I see something and I can, I can go play and, and work on developing something or, Hey, I noticed this is a problem and I want to fix it. I can, I can do that. So it's really, really fun. 
It sounds fun and you can hear the engineering mindset coming through, like trying to explore where there are opportunities to improve things or troubleshoot. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sounds fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And it's a lot of like, is it even worth it? You know, <laughs> is it, it's one of those, like you think about it in race car terms. I always use this for like cost cap. I'm going to spend a million dollars and it's only going to get me a half a tenth. Is it really worth that half a tenth? Right. And so it's like, mm. is, do I spend my time here on a low hanging fruit? Do I kind of roll that into something bigger? It's a lot of triage as well. And that was one of the transferable skills I really felt like I brought was a good understanding of what should we spend our time on versus like, this isn't priority one. And it was kind of cool to see a lot of my regular automotive side skills transfer like they did. And so that's been kind of fun too, is being able to say like, this is the priority. This is, this is maybe let's, let's get to the grid with this first, because I like, this is, this is hot. And then we can, we can come back and look at this later, which is kind of the stuff I like to do. I'm the, I'm the chaotic one and the, the psychotic one who, when the, the building's burning, I don't <laughs> run away from it. I run towards it because I want to solve it. So it, it leverages a lot of that weird thing in my brain that loves to do that <laughs> um, some people see that as a like a good thing and I'm, I'm like I'm an insane person but it's fine <laughs> um in, in me so I I think it's been such a good mix and I've I'm still kind of fresh in the job but I absolutely love it and it's been so fun and it's really kind of brought the things I love about engineering and, and working in the industry into one and then it's it's on race cars yeah I mean I can hear the enthusiasm coming through and, and you mentioned you're fresh in the job. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. those at McLaren, hopefully put your fingers in your ear, but uh, do you have a sense of where you want to go in this profession or are you seeing how it goes and, and finding out what you enjoy? I am still definitely learning what I enjoy. There's a lot of, do you want to sit here and code this or would you like to do this instead? And a lot of them learning where I think I will feel best suited versus the needs and everything like that. And it, it's been really great. And I feel just so well supported. And so that's, even if you are listening, McLaren, I feel so well supported and able to say, hey, you know, this isn't working for me or hey, I, I, I want to do this or I want to kind of pursue this path. I'm given the tools and the ability and, and kind of the support to, to do that, which I think has been so fantastic so far. And, and I think that this is going to be a great kind of spot for me to grow. I still kind of am trying to understand the path and how things kind of work in, in all of that. But I think that this is a great like get in and, and really start to learn, obviously, because I don't have a lot of the professional motorsports experience like we were talking about. It's a really good opportunity for me to do that and, and grow from there as I learn kind of the path and where I can take it. But I think that as a whole so far, the company has been so supportive of me being like, hey, I actually think that I would be better suited with this. I can learn. I would love to learn that. I'm always willing to learn but like at the end of the day, it doesn't really get me going, you know? So like, it's one of those things, but I think that the way that they work and kind of the team and everything, it's just going to be a great place to, to grow at and continue to grow. I can imagine. Uh, and yeah, best, best of luck with that. Uh, something that, Thank you. No, no problem. I'm sure you've spoken to many more people in the motorsport community than I have, but interviewing a few of them over the last couple of seasons of this show, you kind of discover that if the downside sometimes is the barrier to entry, the upside is the relationships and the importance of, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, building that network that you have within the sport. So I'm sure yeah. that 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 will sort of see you on your way as you as you sort of progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the the network is definitely already kind of come in handy, and I think just the network in general. And that's what I always tell people is networking is the best kind of tool, even just getting to know people and and talking to them and, and kind of learning about them and, and the industry and where they come from is such a good tool and such a great thing. And, and relationships that you can build are fantastic. Even if it's not, you don't have a professional goal in mind. It's just one of those things that relationships are so valuable, especially in this industry. And it, it'll, it'll just help you in the end, you know? And I always, I always say, I would say this is like a piece of advice to people looking back is be hungry, humble, and kind and willing to learn. And, and that's about others and about yourself and about, and about the space. Right. And so I think that the, the networking and everything is, is so invaluable. Be humble, kind, and willing to learn. Yeah. Brilliant yeah. values. <laughs> so, um, if you don't mind, we'll turn our attention to formula one. Sure. Um, and I have the solution. I have 
the thing that is going to make Formula One an even bigger deal in the US. Do you want to hear what it is? Okay. Yes. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to take the Ferrari and we're going to paint it blue. Uh, and that <laughs> is what is going to bring in millions more fans. So uh, at time of recording, the news is broken that uh, Ferrari will paint their car blue for the Miami Grand Prix. So what is your immediate comment on this Molly and how successful do you think it will be? I'm super intrigued because I actually think that that's a nod to a historic Ferrari mm. that they have run or some sort of testing livery they ran on, if I recall correctly, I believe it was for a Monza race. So I'm actually really, really excited to see how they execute that and see what that really is kind of playing into that. I don't do a lot of like, these are my favorite teams and these are my favorite drivers, but I am a Ferrari girly. It's kind of always underneath it all. I've, I, I am a Tifosi. And so I actually do believe that that is a nod to something historic for them because I, I don't know if this is a milestone year in terms of like what they have, but I do believe that that's kind of like a historic thing. Mm. So that could be cool. As for how much I think it will help them, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're seeing this car has a lot of positives to it versus the previous year. Um, and I think, don't quote me, someone can come yell at me if I do misspeak. There will be some upgrades in Miami. This is where the whole like I'm in my NASCAR bubble is coming in. I'm not super up to speed on the upgrade cadences, but I think they're bringing some stuff. But I think from what we've seen on the other street circuits, this could be a good race for them. Obviously, the RB20 is the car to beat, but with a blue Ferrari, I think anything's possible. <laughs> right, exactly. It's going to bring in the ratings. So um, yes. you you are an expert because I all I can do is search, right? So I search Ferrari blue livery. So you said, it, is it to do with a milestone or you, you know, thought it was? It is. It is Ferrari's 70th anniversary oh. in the US oh. marketplace. So uh, one point for you. And then the second one is that it says that in 1964, so what would that be? 60 years ago? I'm trying. I don't want to yeah. admit my age, 60, right? Exactly. Yeah, I can't believe that. Yeah, 60. 60. I remember it was 30 years ago. Oh but um, apparently, Enzo Ferrari got annoyed with the FIA and handed back Ferrari's racing license, and so the Ferraris <laughs> were basically entered as privateers for the last two rounds and painted blue. So I think that's where it comes from. So there we are. That's incredible. But you kind of knew that. How did you have that in your brain? You kind of had that somewhere, like saved yeah that's my brain is so weird it's like useless random race car information bar trivia knowledge and then actual engineering knowledge which i don't need apparently just gets thrown out half the time but i feel like what i've i've seen at least with ferrari is they don't act without reason and they don't do something without reason it's kind of the italian way right they they always there's always a reason behind what they do so when i was like i'm pretty sure there's a milestone that the cars were blue for some reason because that's like they they'll have blue painted cars for certain promos and stuff and so i was like i feel like kind of just put it together of how my mind works like that's probably a milestone of some kind if it, if it was blue just like there's the iconic yellow there's the red and the different kind of things and like there there's something with the blue and i couldn't remember what it was i just knew that there had to be something you got it um so let's uh go back in time and just briefly talk about the china grand prix um, so three questions, uh, all of which have sure. kind of a key word beginning with an S. So first one, uh, this was the first sprint weekend of the season. Um, what's your view broadly on sort of the sprint edition of Formula One weekends? And did this weekend work for you? So this particular sprint weekend was the first with the changed Park for May rules. And I think for me, that was one of the biggest successes, I would say, where the teams are allowed to change the car in between the two qualifying sessions. Whereas in the past, Park for May happened on Friday for the entire weekend, and that was it. For your sprint qualifying and your qualifying and the race itself, you were frozen at that point, which then led to the teams prioritizing a race setup versus a sprint race setup. They wanted to put their priority on Sunday. So I actually quite liked this sprint weekend, especially from that standpoint, because then the teams could focus on obviously the wet condition qualifying and the setup for that and cater towards what the conditions would be in the sprint race and then go ahead and make the changes that they needed for qualifying um, for the actual Sunday race. So I did actually quite like that structure. I think kind of tying into the whole weekend i don't think the teams thought that the tires were 
were did what they were going to do. And I think that that played into kind of the pace of the sprint race and, and what happened. George doing the sprint on softs was a huge telltale and a huge learning opportunity, which I thought was super interesting. I was like, there's no way he's going to make it this race on softs. And he did. So it was super fascinating. And I, I actually quite liked it. And I hope that they do keep that from a like tech and, and working standpoint for the weekend, because I think that made kind of the sprint to Sunday more successful, in my opinion. Added another S to the mix, the soft tire. So thank you very much yes. for that. Um, and and yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I hadn't spotted the uh, Park Ferme changes. Uh, I'd noticed the sort of yeah. order was a bit different. So um, that's fascinating. And, and maybe it explains, as you say, why it was more entertaining. And, and as a mm -hmm. sort of a mere Lewis Hamilton fan, it was good to see him uh, you know, near the front again uh, for once. Yes. So enjoyable. Yes, it was. Yeah. Well, um, the second S is safety. So yes. um, unfortunately, um, Valtteri Bottas, I think he was running quite well. He definitely had a good qualifying. Uh, and his engine, I guess another S, the Salva uh, conked out. Yes. <laughs> and he was stuck. Look, why am I saying all these S's? I need to stop. But anyway, look, uh, he, he fantastic. I know, I can't help it now. It's like Tourette's, but... He was in the firing line, right? So uh, for me, it felt like a very long time before they brought out the VSC. And we remember that Jules Bianchi, you know, had his sort of near fatal and then ultimately fatal crash under waved yellows uh, when the safety car was out. So um, what's your view generally on, I suppose, uh, the approach to safety in Formula One? You obviously have the exposure to NASCAR and you can see the comparison there. Yeah, what's your view on that in terms of safety? So with like the Valtteri Bottas incident, for sure, that should have been immediately thrown because he was out of the car at that point. The car was stricken in an area where it was probably dangerous and it, it had another car, had an incident. He was right in that runoff, right? He's in kind of the firing line, as you said. And so that should have been kind of a no questions asked, throw it immediately. And I get the whole you're going to try and give the driver every opportunity to get going, right? Because especially a lot of fans might not know this, especially in Formula One, NASCAR, um, IndyCar, a lot of these other series, you get out of the car, you're done. There are series where you can get back in. So like NASCAR, you, you get out of the car, you're required to go have a check at the medical center, but then you can get back in the car. You're not out at that point as far as I'm aware in the rule book. And so Formula One, you get out of the car during the race, you're done. So I get that there's a, we want to try and give the driver every opportunity for them to get going before they have to get out of the car and not throw a caution or like a yellow flag because that's happened in NASCAR. Sometimes they'll throw the caution and then the car gets going. But um, it's kind of one of those that really was clear that that was a catastrophic failure. That car was not going to get going. It was in a racing line. There should have been something thrown immediately. And I felt like for that personally, that's why the VSC is there. They should have thrown a VSC immediately in that instance and kind of slowed the field down because he was in kind of a firing line position um, at that point. And it's not like the FIA can't see what's wrong with his car. They can see telemetry. So there really isn't like an excuse there, in my opinion. And it was like, well, why do we even have the VSC then? And if you were to look at similar situations in any series, if you are in the firing line at that point and cannot get moved or going, it's going to be yellow the whole course because there has to be assistance and the driver has to get out on track. And so I felt like that situation, they really kind of dropped the ball and it took forever to throw the yellows. And even if they implemented slow zones, like at um, Circuit de la Sarthe for uh, 24 hour of Le Mans, for anybody not familiar, that track is so large they can't throw a full course caution, full course yellow because of how big the track is. Sometimes they'll do slow zones and it'll be from this set of flags to this set of flags in this specific sector. It'd be like sector five is a slow zone, which means I'm under full procedures of like a safety car, like a VSC because of a stricken car or an issue. And I feel like something like that, if they don't want to throw something that neutralizes the whole field, they could they could have they could easily implement something like that because they already do it in one of their other FIA governed series. But from my standpoint, China was a huge miss, especially because weren't their cars going by at speed while Valtteri was standing by his car? Like I felt like that was a huge opportunity that was missed from a safety standpoint and would want to see that corrected. 
No, I agree. And thanks for bringing in that comparison to other series. Um, and yeah. like I listened to Off Track with Hinch and Rossi yes. and they talked yes. last season a bit. I love the podcast. And they talked about because they don't have virtual safety car in IndyCar, that race control mm-hmm. tries to be smart about not like interfering, yes. I suppose, with the race by timing yes. the caution so that you're not going to advantage or disadvantage anyone and destroy their race. Yes. Um, and but, yes. but when you and have then... VS, yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say on the flip side of that, though, that is a series that will not hesitate no. if there is a big problem, though. Yeah. That's that's a series that will do every effort to not interfere like Hinch and, and Rossi were saying. They'll actually time it so cars can get to the pits. It doesn't screw anybody over. Um, the, they'll time it. They'll, they'll keep an eye on it accordingly. They'll make every effort to finish the race not under like a safety car or a full course yellow. But the moment that, that an incident happens, that it's very clear that assistance is needed, there is zero hesitation the safety team is to the car sometimes before like the car has stopped moving in an incident and they do not hesitate to throw the yellow flag in emergent situations where it is like a, yeah, we, we need to do this. And that's kind of the flip side is they they'll do that, but they do it in a way and the culture around it that there still is no question or hesitation. If that makes sense. Like if it's very clear that, this is not emergent. They'll they'll kind of wait like Hinch and Rossi were saying, but that's a series that's a great contrast that you brought up that they will throw it, no questions asked. And just if it, it bunches the field up, it does. And that's what it is. Yeah. And <coughs> as you said earlier, Formula One has the option of the virtual safety car. So there's essentially no excuse. Um, so drawing, drawing the comparison, interestingly, the, the final S is S for stroll because we can't let <laughs> the Chinese Grand Prix fade into obscurity and into the past without describing uh, what he happened to do at the end of the back straight. The comparison with IndyCar is that Pato Award did the same thing to his teammate mm-hmm. about seven, eight hours later uh, and then immediately apologized. So Stroll was yeah. slightly less apologetic and was unhappy that he received a penalty. Um, what's your view on, if you saw it, the Stroll incident, um, yes, whether he did. was to blame? Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a lot, like, this isn't like I'm not taking sides, but I think that there's a lot of stuff to understand. And I think that Pato was kind of right and being like, yo, that was my bad. And the field bunched up and I I screwed up. And I think that that's kind of where Lance maybe could see it a little bit better. I call that checking up. That's kind of the American version of that when the field will kind of slow up like that because somebody in front of them slows down. It's kind of like on the freeway and all the cars hit the brakes in front of you. Um, that's like we call it checking up in NASCAR. It happens all the time. Um, you get into the car in front of you and it you wind up kind of hitting them and, and denting their car or spinning them out and, and it sucks and it's what happens. And sometimes it's unavoidable. And if you get hit from behind and you're just in the chain reaction, it, it can happen. But I think seeing the onboard, what Lance was doing, and this is kind of one of those, it's just in how drivers think. He likely wasn't anticipating the checkup happening of all the cars in front of him because he was looking at the apex. He had already switched his focus because he he knew his spacing to Daniel. And so he's already focusing on the exit of that turn, knowing that this is going to be where I need to go now and watch his placement there. His visual reference already changed. And so he didn't even see that. So that is a little bit of a, like, it's on him. He, he was not anticipating, I think is the word that he used. And that's kind of just how drivers often operate. They're looking beyond the car in front of them. They're often not even looking at the car in front of them. They're looking at a different visual marker. And I think that's kind of the key of what happened and Yes, it's on Lance because he did that, but it just is kind of when you understand that's how drivers operate and then that this checking up and everything can happen, it was kind of bound to happen. I'm surprised we haven't seen it sooner on a Formula One restart. It definitely was partially on Lance, but I think it was also like the field checking up. It's on whoever started the checkup is kind of a byproduct of them slowing up, which I actually think Max said that was his fault. Um that he kind of accidentally did that and it's just kind of a byproduct of, of his safety car games. Um, but it's one of those things that I thought it was ironic, the duality of, of what happened and Pato to say that, you know, that was my bad. And it was the same situation where just everything checked up and he got into Alex because his visual reference likely changed and wasn't anticipating it. So 
it, it sucks. And I think that there is a rightness to the rage. And I do think that maybe you should talk it out a little bit. But I think when I, I understanding that I'm like, yeah, that was bound to happen knowing that that's why Lance likely wasn't looking directly at Daniel when Daniel's like he was looking in his mirrors or looking at the apex and was really upset. That's just, that's normal and it, it can happen and it just kind of sucks. And that's where the, the lack of anticipation came from. So I agree that probably worth the penalty because he should have been paying attention to Daniel. I get why his visual would have changed and he took his attention off of the car, but I think it was justified. Um, I mean, that's pretty, pretty blatant. I don't like other series don't penalize for that, but um, when it, it comes to something like that, where it's race ruining, I, I think it was justified and fair. It, for me, it was reminiscent of a kind of nineties computer game where their AI cars can stop immediately. And then you're like, Oh, well, that's yeah. not going to happen for me. I was just looking because you mentioned about whether like it happening before. I remember uh, the 2020, Grand Prix at Mugello, which is obviously not a common yeah. Formula One circuit. It happened on the main straight. And again, that was checking up or concertinering where drivers were getting on it yep. and getting out of it. And someone got caught out at the back. So, Yep. Yeah. It, um, almost actually reminded me of, um, was it Azerbaijan 2018 uh, with the two Red Bulls mm. uh, with Max and Daniel infamously where um, I think Max got up under him or he got up under Max and it ended both of their races. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, I think it was Ricardo trying to overtake Max and possibly that yes, was the moment yes. where Danny was like, mm, I need to leave because I think he felt Max yeah, was to blame. Yeah, 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 that's, it was like giving me very much like those vibes again. And I was like, oh, this looks familiar. I've seen this song before. <laughs> the taylor swift quote and i don't like the ending or whatever it is look we got some singing as well for free amazing, amazing, amazing. um well as we sort of come towards the end of what's been a fantastic conversation um we have a couple more questions they're a lot shorter so one of them it's a game we like to play with our guests called taxi dinner avoid so essentially you have to pick one driver that you want to drive you to dinner because they are the best driver you want a driver to have dinner with because you think they're the most fascinating personality. And then, you know, and this tests your diplomacy or you end up being quite direct. The driver that you would like to avoid because perhaps you think they are not the character you would like to, to mix with. So taxi, dinner, avoid. Normally we sort okay. of say the F1 grid, but do you know what? I'm going to be lenient and say anyone from any motorsport, taxi, trip. You know. Oh my gosh, that's so many. That's no, so well, no many pressure. Drivers. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. Come on, engineer. You can, it can okay. be suboptimal. <laughs> you know? It's like, you know me, I'm such a perfectionist. <laughs> okay. Taxi, best driver. I think taxi would be, ooh. I think Max would be my taxi driver. I mean, obviously he's the best and I just get the vibes that he'd have like a killer playlist, even though as the passenger, like I technically get aux cords rights. I feel like he would have a fantastic vibe going on that dinner ride and the music would be fantastic. So I will say Max um, dinner. I'm going to try and actually stick to the F1 grid because this gets really involved when I start running down the IMSA grid. And some of the other grids. My two dinner, I'm going to give you two. I'll give you an F1 and a non-F1. Um, Pierre Gasly from the F1 grid, I think he is so fascinating. And, like, he's somebody that I just want to, like, get to know a little more. Because we see, like, his PR personality and all of that. But I think, like, he's somebody that really fascinates me. Like, he's a math prodigy. I didn't know this. So I think that he would be really cool to have dinner with. And then my non-F1 dinner would be Kamui Kobayashi, who is the team principal of Toyota Gazoo Racing in WEC. He's the head of Toyota Racing. And he also is like one of the greatest of all time um, sports car and endurance drivers, also former Formula One driver. Um, I think that he is just a really interesting person. He's got a huge interest in coffee. He has a coffee line and he actually has this like zero emissions coffee trailer he brings to races in Japan with his own beans for the paddock. So I think that he would be really cool to talk to and kind of learn about kind of not only the racing side but then getting involved in the business side like he has to then become the head of kind of Toyota racing um and, and kind of oversee all of that on top of being a very decorated and very successful race car driver and avoid hmm 
I'm actually going to say Daniel Ricardo, and this is rooted in the fact that he almost ran me over on a scooter in Austin, <laughs> Texas. So I'm going to say avoid. <laughs> yeah, that's a good answer. And and you didn't impugn his character. Um, it was kind of like a legit reason to avoid someone. You managed to yeah, avoid him, right? There, there's a legit reason there. I, I'm somebody that you, if you haven't gotten this vibe, you have to give me like a legitimate reason to not like you. <laughs> And so that's I I'm like he like just that I'm like you know what we're gonna avoid the the side eye we were given when this happened was like all right we're good <laughs> all right so legit there's a legitimate reason there at least can you imagine uh, that he you know crashes into you has an injury and can't race like that would be I don't know you'd be part of major news so you know, not saying you're less <laughs> so valuable funny, than him. This is you know. Yeah, this is a funny story, actually, speaking of like Daniel Ricardo being hurt. It's mm. not funny, but when he was out with his wrist last year, I actually got hurt so badly at the U.S. Grand Prix. I got to visit the medical center and in an effort to try and be like, you're in good hands. They kept trying to tell me without violating HIPAA laws that um, they were they had seen like they're obviously checking drivers and medically clearing drivers so like oh yeah the grid's been in and out of here medically clearing them and I was like sitting there and I put two and two together myself I'm like so basically Daniel Ricardo was in here and now I don't think I trust any of you <laughs> <laughs> but it was like they were just like yeah we've had drivers in here and all of that and like getting checked out and making sure they're clear for the weekend and just trying to like comfort me because we think that my ankle is broken basically and I'm like, you're not helping. <laughs> oh, dear. And was your ankle broken? More to the point? No. Oh, my gosh. Thank goodness it was not. I was on crutches for the rest of the weekend, which kind of sucked. But it was really, really still fun. I had a great time. And I was taken very well care of by the the Red Bull team who I was there with. And then Aston Martin after I did get hurt. And then even, like, I was at, like, one of the parties on crutches, like, nothing was stopping me that weekend so wow not broken badly sprained but it was like really funny that they were like yeah we've saw the drivers and I'm like you're not helping me <laughs> <laughs> as they're x-raying my ankle and the, the critical care nurse has come over from the helicopter and he's like yeah I want to see this and when when somebody does that usually you know that it's gonna be bad and I was like, oh no, like I'm, it's going to be broken. I'm going to need surgery. Like they're going to have to fly me out of here. Like it's bad. Like something's bad. And luckily it wasn't, but there was a fun little side quest to CDF one medical center, but yeah, <laughs> luckily not broken. Wow. I mean, two observations. One, I think fate is trying to connect you and uh, Daniel Ricciardo. I just have that feeling. <laughs> right? Two, how did I bury the lead in this interview that it's an hour in and you're talking about medical helicopters and x-rays and being at Aston Martin and Red Bull parties? Like, what the hell? Like, there's a whole other episode <laughs> in that. Incredible, incredible. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, that's, I don't even know. That was wild. That's, I made a little video about getting to see the, um, the medical center. It wasn't on my bingo card. Very, very interesting though, from a like, what, what would happen if you were here kind of thing. No, well, um, that is a good segue to for you to tell our listeners where they can find you, where they can keep in touch across all of the different sure. ventures you have. So, yeah, what do you, where, where can we find you? Okay, so you can find me, like we mentioned on TikTok, where I am a bunch of red flags, all one word. And that is like my tech talks where I break down kind of like the upgrades and some of the tech about Formula One and all the other cars. Um, and then I have two podcasts, which are Engines, EVs, and Espresso, and Breaking Bias with friend of the pod, Dr. Obbs. And those are under, I think it's Breaking Bias Pod and Ecube Pod on all platforms. And then you can find me on Twitter. I do a lot of threads on Twitter, usually, or I'll tweet out observations, um, which is my first name, Molly, the letter M underscore O. Um, and then I think I'm on Instagram. I don't even know, but I have a link that has kind of all my master links. So if you find me on any of those platforms, you can find me on the rest of them. Basically, those are kind of the like big ones where I'm the most active, I would say, with kind of tech content and keeping in touch. I'm on LinkedIn, if that's your jam, like you said, you research on LinkedIn. So I'm out there too. So I'm pretty easy to find. Just punch me in. But those are kind of the main main spots you can find me. Brilliant. Well, it's been a pleasure. And we can't let any guests go without asking the most fundamental life question. Are you ready? Sure. <laughs> Do you know what to expect? Like, uh, maybe you don't. I don't know. Like, No, I don't. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so 
Do you like the occasional pizza? Yes. Okay, that wasn't the question. That was a setup. It's fine. Okay. Okay. So yes or <laughs> I no? I have a feeling I know where this is going. <laughs> right. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yes. Oh. How are you so affirmative? Oh, that? God. Unbelievable. Uh-huh. Oh. You're on Team I Georgie. I love a good pineapple on pizza. Uh, but can you, I, I, I'm going to ask you to justify that. You know, would you choose it? If you were in a pizza pi- uh, place, would you go and buy yes. a pineapple on pizza or would you? Absolutely. Yes. That's if it's an option and it sounds good and I'm in the mood for a little bit of like sweet and spicy and like salty and get kind of all of the flavors going. Absolutely. I think you've been paid by Georgie to say this because this just doesn't, I don't know, it feels too enthusiastic about pineapples, but you know, fun. I love, I literally, I love pineapple on pizza. My, one of my go-to <laughs> pizza orders has pineapple on it. Amazing. Okay. Well, look, uh, all jokes aside, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show and thank you for your like infectious energy. It's like uh, 9.08 here in the UK and I'm now like fully awake and, uh, you know, excited. <laughs> so thank you very much. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys for having me so much too. This was such a blast. We should do like a uh, stripping the dipping, breaking bias, e cubed, whatever crossover. I can see a kind of quiz coming up, right? We need a quiz master, but I can see that. Although it can't be about engineering because you would beat us. Uh, it has to be something, <laughs> you know, mediocre. And I, I would, I'd fancy my chances. Um, well, look guys. I love a good bar <laughs> trivia and like pub trivia. So I'm, I'm oh. totally down. <laughs> now see, I picked the wrong person here, but no. Uh, okay. It would be our pleasure. Um, guys, if you've gotten this far into the episode, wherever you're listening or watching, give us a five-star review, a thumbs up, and give us a comment. Find us at Strip the Dip on all of your social medias. Until next time, I've been your host, F1 Plague. Good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>